Chip seat studies have found that Cas9 stably interacts with hundreds to thousands of PAM sequences across the genome with any given guide RNA. So not just the on target, but lots and lots of off targets. Cas9 tends to not cleave most of these targets, but a small number of them will be cleaved and will end up getting mutated. Uh, and sometimes they will get mutated just as efficiently as the on-target, sometimes more. These off-target sites typically have one to three mismatches uh, in the protospacer region. Um, so there can be tens to hundreds of off-target sites for any given guide. We've only got 20 of bases of specificity to begin with, um, so the fact that it accepts it tolerates mismatches of, of between one and three bases does mean that there are a lot of potential off-target sites out there. Uh, Large-scale studies uh, of mutagenesis um, have found that while some guides are better than others, there's no really reliable rules for predicting what will be a more specific guide than another, unfortunately. So there's, there's no real computational way of saying this is going to be a better guide than another, other than to say one guide's got less potential off targets than another. What has been found is that the first three bases of the protospace, protospacer, surprisingly, are dispensable for on-target cleavage. So there's only 17 bases of specificity required, um, and the first three of these can be mismatched. Um, and in general, it's been found that Cas9 tolerates more mismatches at the five prime end of the protospacer. And these 12 bases here, which some, some groups have called the seed region, are, are, are more specific and, and are more important. And certainly are going to be involved in those early stages of, of, of unwinding um, the genomic duplex um, and, and, and forming the, the CRISPR complex. So there are lots of tools out there for measuring off-target mutagenesis. Um, so groups have done ChIP-seq to see where Cas9 binds in cells. They've in, done in vitro site selection experiments, um, or they prepare genomic DNA and cleave it with Cas9 in vitro to find off-targets, and they, that, that does indeed um, stack up with what actually happens in vivo. Or you can do very clever methods which capture DNA breaks in cells uh, and you can pair, prepare DNA libraries of those breaks and then do high throughput sequencing and therefore sequence what's actually happening in cells. And all of these met methods have been really powerful in helping to describe off-target events in general, but uh, I would argue it's not practical to perform um, off-target assays like this in, in most of your experiments. You really need to avoid off-target off activity in the first place, if you can. So there are design tools out there um, for ZFNs, Talons, and CRISPR, um, web tools out there that, that generate lists of potential off-target sites. And so some re researchers, um, usually because uh, reviewers of, in, in certain journals have asked them to do it, uh, will perform um, target-specific assays on a small number of, of those off-target sites, um, typically those that uh, reside in protein-coding exons, to confirm whether the, the CRISPR-mutated cells um, don't have mutations at some other off-target. Um, alternatively, you could um, do lots of genomic PCR assays on all these different off-target sites, pool them, and send them for deep sequencing, and then profile that mutagenesis on quite a large scale. So, as I say, I don't think this is practical for most people. I think if you're developing um, uh, medical strategies, so you're doing some sort of um, uh, gene therapy style approach and you're doing gene correction in, in a patient's stem cells, then certainly there's a lot of pressure on you to, to look 
an off-target activity and confirm that it's not occurred in your experiment. Um, but I think for most people, uh, th this is, is too time consuming. So we need to avoid off-target activity as much as possible. So how can we make CRISPR more specific? There's a lot of different ways. So the first and most obvious one is do not express Cas9 for too long or for too high a level. The off-target sites generally are inefficient sites. Uh, the Cas9 complex might not be very stable at these off-targets or the cleavage activity uh, may not be very high at these targets. So obviously, the more Cas9 you have and the longer you express it, you increase the chance of cleaving um, and mutating these weaker sites. So if you can, use Cas9 mRNA or protein in, in your most important experiments. Um, another quite clever approach is you could use, um, so in, in the sort of DNA vector-based approaches, you could use an additional guide RNA in, in, in addition to the ones that you need for your experiment. You can use one against the Cas9 expression vector itself. And so obviously Cas9 will be expressed and will function uh, for a few hours. But when it is functional, that vector itself gets cleaved um, and may well get lost. But certainly you won't be making any more Cas9 messenger RNA. So after that initial... A uh, burst of Cas9 expression and function, Cas9 will be lost. Um, and so what you end up with is, is quite low levels of and, and, and low persistence of, of CRISPR when you use a self-targeting guide. That's quite clever. Another approach is to change the guide RNAs. So as I mentioned, the first three bases of the protospacer uh, are not essential for on-target activity. So you can use what's called a truncated guide RNA where the guides just have 17, um, 18 or 19 nucleotide protospaces. Uh, the vast majority of these work at your on target, but those off targets are, are, are substantially weakened now. And so you tend to find off target mutagenesis falls quite considerably at almost all of your off target sites. Um, so that, that's quite a clever approach. Another approach is to use a dual Nikkei strategy, which I shall go through and describe. Or you could use an enhanced specificity mutant of Cas9. So this is an engineered version of Cas9 uh, where they've engineered out its, its loose specificity. And again, I shall describe that later on. The dual Nikkei's approach for CRISPR takes advantage of the fact that Cas9 has these two separate nuclease domains that cleave either the top or the bottom strand of your genomic target. And mutation of either one of these nuclease domains would lead to Cas9 being a Nikkeis. So for example, the D10A mutant, which mutates the catalytic domain of the RUV-C nuclease domain, means that Cas9 can only nick the target strand and it won't, won't cut the PAM strand. Alternatively, the H840A mutant takes out the catalytic domain of the H and H nuclease, and so now this enzyme can only nick the PAM strand. So now we have a nick. Nicks are repaired quite faithfully in mammalian cells, so a nick in itself doesn't do very much. So if you nick your genomic target or an off target, it will get repaired faithfully you shouldn't get any mutagenesis. However, if you use this strategy, where you use two guide RNAs, and I've just called them A and B, and they need to be arranged in this orientation, so the PAM sites are facing out, and they're on opposite strands. These two guide RNAs will recruit the Nikkeis at the same time, hopefully, so in this case, we're using the D10A mutant. And it will nick the target strand in each case. So you've got nicks on opposite strands. If those two Cas9 nickases bind and nick at the same time, then what you end up with is a double strand break. 
but instead of it being a blunt break, it's now got a long overhang between those two nick points. So in this case, we'll have a long five prime overhang between this point here all the way to there, and on the opposite strand, a five prime overhang here. And so if you use the D10A mutant, you create five prime overhangs. If you use the H840A mutant, you create three prime overhangs using the same guide RNAs. So you have this flexibility now. So I'm just going to show this again, but uh, in a more realistic scenario where the strands are, are unwound. So we have coincident binding of two Cas9s that are bound next to each other and they nick at the same time. Because these strands are already unwound by Cas9, the complex will fall apart creating a double strand break with these overhangs. So it's been found that the tail to tail orientation, as it were, um, of these uh, complexes is, is, or, or PAM out orientation of two guide RNAs uh, is the most reliable way of creating uh, double strand breaks using the dual Nikkei strategy. Uh, and this offset's quite important. If the two guides are too close to each other, the Cas9s cannot bind at the same time because they're getting in each other's way. If the offset's too large, then the chance of the, the two bubbles, the, the unwound bases in one, com in your let's say your A complex and your B complex merging into one large bubble will reduce. Um, and so you again, you won't get a double strand break. You'll just get two nicks. Um, so there's an optimal window in which this works. Uh, but there are tools out there that have, um, allow you to, to go and design the, these guides, these dual Nikkei strategies, uh, which are quite straightforward. Um, so when you use the dual Nikkei strategy, your on-target cleavage uh, is often quite similar to using uh, Cas9, wild-type Cas9 with a single guide. Um, it tends to be far more mutagenic than uh, conventional CRISPR, because those overhangs often get lost, so you often get larger deletions. So in the case of making knockouts, it's a, a little bit easier um, with the dual Nikkei strategy. Um, and the key thing is your off-target activity is near zero uh, when people have looked, because the chance of these two guides having off-targets that are in this arrangement somewhere else is is, is minuscule. So here I'm going to show you um, a typical approach um, to making um, knockout cell lines uh, using a dual Nikkei's and that's this is something that uh, uh, an undergraduate student did uh, in our laboratory. Um, so it's very easy to do. So firstly, design your mutation strategy, and this very much depends on your gene of interest. In this case, this was a transcription factor gene, so we targeted the first exon which had the DNA binding domain encoded within it. So this was exon 2. Um, if it's an enzyme, you might target the catalytic domain. The only thing to really consider is whether your, your gene of interest has multiple promoters and multiple splice forms, because if you target the ATG or start site of one splice form, you may not knock out another splice form, which might take over. So you might not get a knockout that you expected. Um, so what you need to design up initially is where to place your guide. So you have an A and a B guide and you've used a, a design tool to help pick those out for you. You design your genomic PCR primers that flank that. Um, and you should always do your genomic PCR assay first and just make sure that you're able to amplify that region cleanly uh, and, and perform um, your, your assays. And in this case, for dual Nikkei's, we prefer to use an RFLP assay to look at the efficiency of mutagenesis. Uh, you then need to, um, so this is a plasmid-based approach. You then need to clone oligos that encode the protospaces uh, for your guide RNAs, and you, you typically clone them into two uh, separate expression vectors, which have the, the polymerase 3 promoters in them. You can then choose to, if you want to, to then lift over these 
um, guide RNA expression units that you've created, so for your A and your B guide, and subclone them into your Cas9 expression vector to make an all-in-one vector. Um, the reason you would do that is that the efficiency of transfection of one plasmid is far higher than two, three, or four plasmids. Uh, so with every additional plasmid you, you add to a transfection, your transfection efficiency will fall quite considerably. So there are quick cloning tools to clone in those protospacer sequences and to move over polymerase 3 promoter units into another vector. So this takes um, a couple of weeks to do all together and, and obviously it's only a, a small portion of your time in those couple of weeks. You then transfect those into cells. Uh, we're using electroporation in this case. And our Cas9 expression vector co-expresses GFP. And so we can look for the fluorescence of GFP. And so this tells us what our transfection efficiency is. And in this case, it's about 90% delivery into the cells. So we know that at most 90% of the alleles of our targets could get mutated. We can't get 100%. At most, it's 90%. So if you're only getting, say, 60% transfection, you need to then adjust your mutagenesis that you'll see later on to that 60% number. You need to normalize to transfection efficiency to understand your CRISPR efficiency. And then we do these RFLP assays. And, and as I warned before, they can um, be sometimes confusing to understand. Um, but in this particular case, we have this PCR product and we're cutting it with one of two different enzymes, so individual digests. This one cuts three times and creates four fragments. This one cuts once and creates two fragments. And we can see in the case of here that guide A with wild type Cas9 uh, works well because we've lost this restriction site that cut these two fragments up. So these two bands disappear and they're lost here and you sometimes see the join of uh, the, the of these two fragments being joined together as in here but often this is mutated as well so it will be a smear it won't be a clean band so the way to quantify this is to quantify the loss of these bands here um, and then alternatively guide b works because the production of these two fragments here is reduced and so we've got lots of uncut product um, and then you can compare those digestion patterns when you're using guides A and B together with the Cas9 Nikkeis. And so from all of this, you can then quantify what percentage of mutagenesis you've got. So 90% um, of the guide A target site was mutated when using guide A. So in other words, this guide was 100% efficient. Guide B, we got 75% mutagenesis with guide B uh, as compared with 90% transfection. So this was a pretty good guide, but not perfect. And then when we used guides A and B together with the Nikkeis, we saw 70% mutagenesis of, of both um, alleles. Um, so basically the dual Nikkeis is as good as your worst guide. And then to find your knockout cells, um, so if you can, you try and clone your polyclonal mix of cells. Um, so you do the CRISP, you do the CRISPR transfection. Uh, three days later, you then dilute out the cells um, to make a single cell per well. Or if the colony forming uh, um, cells, you would then. Um, plate out uh, in a dilute way such that individual colonies uh, would grow up from individual cells. You then pick those colonies or lines and then you screen them. And it's easiest to screen them for what you're interested in first. So in this case, we're interested in the knockout of the protein that we're looking at, which was um, VESF1 in this case. And we can see that of these nine lines tested in this first run here, Two of them have lost VESF1 um, protein expression. And then uh, we've probably got two that are quite normal. And then we've got another five where we seem to have either heterozygous mutation um, or, or sort of frame or, or, or mutations which haven't created a, a frame shift knockout, but certainly have really um, screwed up expression of VESF1. Um, 
So it's best to identify cells which have lost your expression first, and then you do the genotyping on those. So you do your RFLP and you do your Sanger sequencing on those. So indeed, these were knockouts on both alleles. Uh, and these these were also, also mutants on both alleles, um, just um, uh, not knockouts on both. It's a knockout and mutant heterozygous. So uh, another approach and a very sensible approach now uh, to doing CRISPR is to use an, an enhanced specificity mutant. So as I said before, Cas9 has evolved to be error prone and um, that enables adaptive immunity to new challenges. Um, and the way it does this is that Cas9 makes many backbone DNA contacts to stabilize complexes prior to cleavage. So Cas9 uses many positively charged residues like lysines and arginines to bind to the negatively charged phosphate backbone of your genomic DNA target strand and of the non-target strand to hold them in place. And uh, researchers use the crystal structure uh, and sort of mass mutagenesis assays to find out which ones of those contacts could be mutated. So you substitute that lysine with an alanine, for example, and see whether Cas9 still functions or not. And then of all those were mutants which still function, they then combine the mutations together to see whether they could get two and three uh, and four residue mutations um, and still have um, Cas9 activity. And indeed, this is what they have. So there are four different enhanced specificity mutants of Cas9 out there now uh, that have been created in different ways, either through sort of rational design or through a sort of screening-based approach. Uh, and, and this slide just shows two of them. So for example, high-fidelity Cas9 mm -hmm. disrupts four contacts between Cas9 and the non-target strand uh, sorry, and, and the target strand, um, this one here, um, and enhanced specificity Cas9, ES Cas9, uh, has three mutations that disrupt contacts with the, with the non-target strand, and, and we have used this one. Um, so a key feature of using these enhanced specificity mutants is now they do not tolerate any mismatches whatsoever, and they need a full 20 base protospacer. So all 20 bases of that protospace are a key to on-target activity. So truncated guides do not work. Extended guides, if you've made a longer guide for some reason, 21, 22 bases, they don't work. Um, and mismatch guides obviously don't work. So off-target activity is almost completely reduced. Uh, there are some off targets in the sort of worst designed guides out there uh, which might still have some activity um, but in general off target activity is lost uh, when you use these mutants so if you can get hold of expression vectors for these enhanced specificity mutants or use um, recombinant proteins with these mutants then certainly try them there are a small number of target sites where Cas9 activity will be reduced when using these enhanced specificity mutants. But by and large, this is still uh, a very potent system. So in summary, CRISPR has rapidly overtaken ZFNs and Talon technologies um, as new targets can be programmed without making any new proteins at all. Um, so that, that barrier to entry of doing genome editing has now gone and really anybody in any field, even people with quite limited molecular biology expertise, can now perform um, genome editing. Uh, CRISPR is becoming widely adopted in most molecular and cell biology fields. Uh, CRISPR is very efficient, but specificity is a major concern, especially if you use wild-type Cas9. So high specificity Cas9 mutants are now available uh, and there are also some um, very clever strategies um, to doing CRISPR as well, which mean that your specificity is, is greatly improved. It's possible to modify multiple targets in parallel and of course you can perform functional genomic screens. Uh, so this is an extremely powerful approach for CRISPR. 
Thanks for watching. Let us know in the comments below what you thought of it. Um, please give us a like and certainly think of subscribing. And we've got a lot more content on this channel, which you can see uh, in the playlists coming up. Thanks.